but I'm really glad to welcome up on stage uh, Björn Stansvik and Elgin Biloy from uh, one of our partners called Coherum. Yes. And I will leave the stage to you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, happy to be here. It's always good to be back. I'm uh, from here, but the last 20 years been um, living in the States, now a resident in the Bay Area in California, uh, starting growing, selling technology companies, and now most recently, obviously, in the field of AI. So uh, we're going to go over a general perspective on AI. And uh, also, uh, I wanted to start with getting a little bit of a sentiment analysis of the room. I'm going to give you four options to raise your hand, and you can vote for a zero or all four or just one. So in terms of AI, how many here would count themselves as skeptics? We have a few. Uh, <laughs> how many would say they're curious? A lot. Okay. okay. <laughs> How many are frustrated by AI? A few. And then how many are very satisfied and proud over their accomplishments with AI? Good. Okay. There's so not fair, that fair, much fair. of a margin. No. So, so curious mostly. Okay. That, that's good to know. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, first we're going to start with uh, introductions, and uh, uh, in, in that area, uh, Elgin would talk a little bit about the fourth industrial revolution. So, you see this theme a lot coming around. I'm not sure, can you hear me fine? I have a smaller head, so it doesn't fit as well. Um, so, you see this theme coming a lot around a lot of companies in private sector that work in information technology and specifically AI, the idea of human progress over time sort of coming to a culmination, right? So, if you look at technological advantages, advancement. It's sort of this J curve in terms of how fast things happen. If you look at the margin in between, for instance, steam to electricity, wow, 100 years. Now let's look at computing to where artificial intelligence comes, a much smaller margin. So we're seeing this ever increasing uh, technological advancement. And I think one of the largest areas we're going to see this next is in AI. So we've seen it before with electricity and then to computing. I remember uh, the, I don't remember because I wasn't alive, but <laughs> uh, the whole software will eat the world thing, right? And a lot of people doubted that when it was first said, but you know, I'm open to anyone in the room disagreeing with software has eaten the world nowadays, right? Tell me one sector it hasn't proliferated uh, wildly. And now the next place that I do believe that's going to happen is in artificial intelligence, as that's just the next step up from technology. Very good. Thanks for that, Elgin. So uh, briefly about Coherium, um, the company won't talk that much about that, but more about AI in general. But it's an auto ML platform where essentially um, we create automatically custom neural network for really anything. Uh, on introductions, I want to talk a little bit about Elgin. So he started coding when he was six and got recruited and with AI when he was 11 and was recruited by Google when he was 12. He lied about his age, said he was 19, got a ticket out there. But when HR looked at him, <laughs> they said, you, you don't look like uh, 19. And then his I took gave, offense too. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, he got a tour of it, but decided he wanted to start his own company uh, and then advanced more, got the PhD from Stanford on, on his own self-studies uh, and then started teaching at uh, 15 at the university level. At 16, he had uh, developed a vision for how to disrupt AI, and then he quickly realized, well, I don't have entrepreneurial experience, so he wrote an AI algorithm to find an entrepreneur. So that's how he found me. Uh, so th that was the start of... <laughs> I, I want to put in like a little placeholder there for the PhD Stanford thing. I took all the courses online, but since I didn't give them money, they yeah. don't they don't actually give you it. <laughs> so he, he, he knows the stuff, but he doesn't have the diploma. So so anyways, we have a few more of our colleagues here today. Um, uh, Gavin and Elidas, who is our uh, Sweden country manager. And in a leadership of eight people, we've been able to pack in five nationalities from the US, Sweden, Japan, Denmark, and Australia. So anyways, let's get into some definitions. So these are the basic basics of AI, what is it? Um, some people debate about it, but loosely we, we think it's a way of uh, describing how computers get intelligent and can start reasoning, but we're really going to focus on a subset of that uh, called machine learning, which is how computers and, and software get smarter through data as opposed to programming, having to program them differently. And if we break down this a little bit further, 
you see AI as the big ring here, right? Computers acting intel intelligently, and then machine learning as uh, computers getting more intelligent from the data they're consuming. Within that, there is a subfield called deep learning, which, which we focus on, and that's using a technology, the NN there, called neural networks that is loosely based on the human brain. So you have nodes and synapses, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Within that, there's a, another subfield actually not illustrated here called uh, hyperparameter selection, where you set up the architectural neural network so they can solve for particular problems you have or opportunities. So what is a neural network? Well, essentially it looks like this, but, but much bigger and much more complex. There could be 20 million nodes here, the yellow things, uh, and then the synapses are the connections between those. Mathematically speaking, this is a universal approximator, meaning it can represent any mathematical function, uh, if you make it big enough, essentially, and then it can learn from different patterns it sees. At, 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 at its basis, uh, neural networks are really prediction engines, although they can be used for, for a number of different things. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? Elton? I think that's good. Um, there's also different variants of neural networks. It's important to mention. So when you look at a business problem, you can typically break that down into a multitude of data types. So oftentimes you see tabular, which is stuff like a CSV or sheets uh, or a SQL database. Uh, then you have a sort of temporal type data like images. Uh, and then finally you have data like audio, right? So forecasting and time sequence and tabular data all fits into one type of neural network, often called a multi-layered perceptron. Um, images typically fit into a type of neural network called a convolutional neural network, and audio also in a convolutional neural network. Uh, so this is a very simplistic view. Typical neural networks run about you know tens of millions of neurons nowadays, and they learn by seeing past examples of different attributes describing a label, and then by seeing so many times that these attributes describe a certain label, they can correlate uh, the different correlation coefficients between that attribute to that label. So maybe you have a bunch of pictures of dogs and a bunch of pictures of cats. Over time, it will learn that these pixel color channel values correlate or a dog or a cat, and then can extrapolate on examples it's never seen before. Yeah. So uh, one thing that is really neat with neural networks is that you don't have to know what's important to solving for your data. So you can throw in everything in the kitchen sink, and the neural networks will automatically understand what matters and what doesn't matter. It's, it's more important to, to get everything in there rather than missing something that's important. Uh, here's a, another illustration of how they work by learning or training, as you say. So very simplistically speaking, if we're doing image analysis and we want to recognize what a dog looks like, you'd give it a, a set of images of dogs, and eventually through forward and backward propagation, the neural network would essentially get very skilled at uh, predicting what is a dog. And at this point, neural networks are surpassing humans in terms of the ability to see and hear and so on. Uh, so that's obviously very useful in a number of cases in industry and uh, society at large. It can also recognize what, what is a different category from what it's uh, been trained on. Uh, and data is obviously everywhere. There's no industry that's immune from this, whether it's in manufacturing, um, lumber, healthcare, retail. There are plenty of examples for, from all of these. And they're very varied and, and diverse. Just to uh, describe a few different ones, um, in healthcare, for example, you know that there's never enough hospital beds, right? So allocating and optimizing how these get apportioned to people and not having to do this very complex scheduling that's done today would be one use of AI. And how that would be done in that particular case would be by first hard coding, what are the ethics guidelines? What are the laws guiding the system? Secondly, predicting how long are the people who are already in the hospital going to stay? Is it short, medium, or long term? And then thirdly, how many people are gonna come tomorrow and next week? Kind of like a weather forecast, but for patients. And then fourthly, looking at what's the capacity, utilization, vacation schedule, et cetera. And then when a new patient comes in, sending a query like a greedy algorithm that quickly finds, okay, so this part, patient that has uh, perhaps been diagnosed with lung cancer should go to this town, this hospital, and this hospital bed. And that would happen within milliseconds, giving that recommendation, and then a human can make the, the final selection. Uh, so it's really, really varied. But one way I think about AI is to say that if it can be sensed or measured in any way that's correlated to what's actually going to happen, if you have, uh, let's say, a big lumber mill and you want to predict when a machine is going to break, then you could do audio recordings, uh, current recordings. You could have a video of how it turns, uh, the temperature, and you know how old the machine is, and, and, and so on. 
and then if there is a signal in all that noise then you can uh, start predicting that so so it's really varied is the point and um, the slides make that point as well there are different categories of uh, types of data that uh, can help um, computers achieve these different abilities whether it's vision or analyzing audio as i alluded to earlier recognizing patterns or both understand and generating natural language yeah. and a lot of times these are already here and you just don't recognize that you're using it so for example google Translate uses a type of neural network called a long short-term memory neural network, and that is able to translate between a multitude of languages. Um, for instance, when Instagram can automatically tag people's faces, that's an example of a convolutional neural network. When the Tesla can drive itself uh, based on recognizing different objects, that's all network. So it's kind of funny because th just this one algorithm of machine learning neural networks are already, you know, so uh, key to people's everyday lives. Google Maps, another example, but people just don't realize that they're utilizing them. So oftentimes people say AI is all hype and I haven't seen any of the benefits yet. No, you just don't realize that you're seeing the benefits every single day. Google search, another example. All right. So let's look at where is AI today. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, in terms of like hype and then people thinking either overhyped or underhyped if I'm curious or se skeptical, uh, I think one of the main issues comes from looking at past AI and not seeing where AI is going. Uh, you, If you want to be a smart, proactive business as opposed to reactive, you need to look at where something's going as opposed to where it's already gone. Retrospect is already 2020. There's nothing impressive about knowing what's already happened. So it's important to look towards the future. So looking at what AI is versus what AI isn't, I feel like the next couple slides will sort of firm that in and explain that in a way that can hopefully make you proactive into seeing. So right now, AI, we can already say is important for many. There's a couple headlines here to grab some attention. Incredible investments from both the Pentagon, $2 billion, and China obviously is another very large one. Um, and it's a top priority for innovators in the private sector as well, if you're seeing how much uh, issues both ethically and business-wise this is making. And uh, again, all of the largest businesses are investing incredible amounts of money in this. If you look at the winners and losers over the last years, uh, well, you can take a hint that the winners are always the ones that are moving with technology, not against it. If you look at you know, printing versus a new Google Docs, there's an example. Uh, really, any business where they took a new type of technology, Uber versus taxi cabs, and they disrupted it, that's where the real effect happens. So what else is AI? AI is visual, right? We have convolutional neural networks. We can do stuff like object detection. We could recognize if someone pulled a gun out of their pocket and automatically sound alarms. We could recognize certain motions and movements to know if something is suspicious or not. Um, AI is auditory. We can recognize, for instance, if a machine was about to break down based on the audio it was making prior to that. We can recognize when I talk to Siri, another example of a neural network, and she understands me, and then uh, creates a command based on that. Um, AI is creative, so this is one that surprises a lot more people if they're not more in the field, is that AI is getting very good at pixel-wise interpretations. So meaning you can take an image of a horse and you can make it a zebra. Uh, now, from this technology, this is oftentimes, you'll see something called a GAN, which is a generative adversarial neural network. It's made by a guy named Goodfellow, very, very intelligent at Google. Um, and these have been used recently for more controversial stuff. So for instance, uh, now China's uh, state-run news sector is done all by an AI that they built, and that is so what does it 24 hours and this is kind of a bit of a benign example but if you think about any industry where people are doing monotonous work that could be represented uh, by statistical algorithms then it's fairly easy to build an AI to do that so we need to start empowering people to work with it as opposed to against it so here's another example of that generative adversarial neural network doing something a little more controversial with uh, you know what we're then called deep fake so the idea here is you take uh, the pixels that represent a person's face and then make that face make uh, say stuff that that they haven't said before. So for instance, just taking a 30 second video of me talking right now, you could then use that video and I've made just about all the shapes with my mouse and now have me say something I've never said before that's practically impossible to discern between the real and the fake. And if that doesn't scare you, then you know, quite frankly, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's just one example of turning George Bush into Barack Obama, Pierce Morgan, Tom Hanks, all sorts of people. Um, AI, uh, more important than anything, in my opinion, is it's accelerating very, very quickly. It's just like those technical advancements, te uh, technological advancements that I was talking about earlier. If you look at the margin between when something is invented and the next steep milestone, these things are always going on a J curve, right? It's a little bit like a population if you learn in biology. They explode at some point, and that point has already been hit for humanity. It's just a matter of us being proactive before the things happen. 
So here is just a little timeline of before from when Alan Turing obviously made the first digital computer. Technically, he wasn't the first, but you know, cracked Enigma, and then going all the way up to when the multi or perceptron was invented, and then just going in the past 10 years when now we have recurrent neural networks for predicting, uh, for instance, like financial data. Uh, the majority of the stock market is now done by neural networks. If we're looking at GANs creating deep fakes, I mean, it gets significantly, significantly faster over time. AI is also you know, gradual. So if you're looking at the progress here, there's the 2014 example of a GAN. I think pretty much everyone in here could say that's not a real person. Same with 2016, there's something eerie about it. And then in literally just two years' time, that is not a real person right there. That is a completely falsified, totally made up. I certainly, for one, could not tell that that was created by an AI. But now just imagine the benefit of being able to make a new voice, a new person, a new face, a new task. Really anything you can imagine so long as you have the data to represent it. Uh, really the only task that's waiting for you is to do it. And, and then also give them skills, whether, whether it's having a doctor, skills, et cetera. Exactly. Yep. So AI, one of the main ways it's able to do this is because now AI is no longer just humans writing down programmatic rules. We were at the first layer where we went from rules-based to AI-based, right? So we had people writing programmatic rules in like Python or Java or whatever language to do something and then those rules being executed. Then eventually we wrote statistical algorithms such that they would be able to inference and make their own predictions. Now more recently, and what Coherium focuses on is auto-generative AI using something called neural architecture search, where basically we're able to take a list of different AI models select the best based on their accuracy, asexually mutate them to create another list of you know 500, select the best and keep doing that. It's the same theory of evolution that spawned all of us in this room here today, except now run with neural networks. That's already there and we've seen this create higher accuracy than a lot of human built neural networks. So you can think of this as mathematical Darwinism, essentially creating mathematical organisms that, that then self improve themselves. And then when they are selected by, by another neural network, that knows what data you're solving for and what business need, it, it can pick the very best ones and then start a, a competition among them so they auto-evolve very, very quickly. So AI overall, it's visual, it's auditory, it's controversial, it's exponential, it's speeding up over time. Now, what does this mean for your business? We've seen over and over again that those who don't go on with the bandwagon of technological advancement are the ones that are left behind in the dust. So really, all this means is that Essentially, there's one choice, and it's if you're going to be utilizing AI or not. And I hope that after this presentation and you've seen the direction it's going as, where it's, as well as where it's already gone, uh, the choice is kind of obvious, but I'll still leave it up to you. Thank you.